Wrestling Observer Radio, Garrett and Dave here with our special guest, Ryan Frederick, to talk about UFC 299. Ryan, what's going on? No, nah, not much. How are you guys doing tonight? Pretty good. Uh, Pretty after good. that uh, very dominant performance by... Sean O'Malley. Uh, I thought it was a, a pretty fun card. Uh, I guess that's the the big news coming out is Sean O'Malley defends his bantamweight title, uh, winning unanimous decision, fifty forty five on two of the cards and fifty forty four over Marlon Cheeto Vera. Let's just start there. Uh, Ryan, go. What, 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 give give me your thoughts on uh, on the main event there. I mean, very clearly, Sean O'Malley just. His boxing was on a whole nother level. Level, uh, you know, a lot of people. The big thing was, you know, was this going to fight, fight going to go like the first fight? You know, when O'Malley injured his ankle and uh, Vera finished him in the first round, and no, nah, complete opposite. Like they're O'Malley, totally, they're, they're totally different fighters. Both totally of them. different fighters from the from then. O'Malley is just he's he's gotten to be one of the best strikers in the sport and. Oh, yeah legitimate legitimate champion champion now i know there's a lot a lot of questions about him because you know he was you know he's one of those guys they were building up building up and sometimes when you when you push guys that quick to title fights and they win in in the way he beat sterling you know finishing him there's a lot of questions is he a legit champion and did i improved i mean he he hit vera with, yeah he hit vera with a lot of shots that would have finished most people that that knee in the second round that sounded like a gunshot was just that Vera eight and just kept coming forward. That was, that was brutal. And you got to give a lot of credit to Vera because he, he ate a ton of hard, hard shots and came out strong in the fourth, you know, trying to finish, finish O'Malley, but O'Malley just came on strong in the last two minutes of the fourth round. And just after shutting out the first three rounds, just a strong performance overall, overall and just you know very very clearly a level above Vera tonight yeah the um I mean yeah he just he just a tremendous in the fight and um Vera like did land some stuff very very late in the fight that that hurt O'Malley and there was a couple of points I mean it's like Vera got shots in here and there but O'Malley you know would would get you know the 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 volume was just way too much. She just was so much, so much better footwork, so much, so much speed. I mean, it's like yeah. just in a pure stand-up fight. I mean, he he was he was tremendous. Yeah, and, just worked, uh, worked the it, body it, tremendously too. Just yeah, ever, yeah everywhere. Just, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was like Vera was a guy who was completely outclassed, and because of his durability and and toughness. I mean, he got some good offense in here and there. He had spurts where he did okay, but overall, I mean, he didn't come close to winning a round. And um, I mean, you know, and it, it, and he was just completely outclassed as a fighter. And um, it's interesting because, um, you know, obviously, you know, Marab Devilishvili should be the next contender, and that's. Uh, a very intriguing fight because of how good Marab has looked. And it's, it's your classic, you know, grappler striker. Um, but he was looking at um, O'Malley afterwards, challenging Leo Tapuria, which interesting fight because I don't think anyone really thought about it until tonight. Um, but it's a real challenge for O'Malley. The other, the other thing, I mean, I think it's a little early to make that fight. Um, but now that he's brought it up, if they both get a couple of wins, I think it could be a super fight, you know, like um, in the year, early next year at some point, maybe. Um, but the other thing that's really clear is, um, you know, they did a, um, what was the gate? 13.75 million? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just under 14 million. Yeah. $14 million gate, which is just unbelievable. It's the largest gate in the history of UFC for a fight that wasn't headlined by Conor McGregor, which I guess speaks volumes about both UFC and Sean O'Malley, um, that they can do a gate for, I mean, like, again, a, a gate of this magnitude for a card that, I mean, it, it was a good card, and, and Benoit Saint-Denis and um, Dustin Poirier was a, you know, on paper, kind of a really exciting semi-main. At the same time, Benoit Saint-Denis still doesn't have a big name. So the idea that, you know, the draw was, you know, to a small degree Poirier, but largely O'Malley and to be able to raise those prices and sell those tickets at those raised prices. Um, he's a superstar. 
in every sense of the word. Are they yeah. going to break that gate for the next show? What? Are they going to break the record for the non? Oh, I, oh yeah, the uh, uh, did, 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 yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah. So the, it'll be a one show record there. Yeah. Go ahead, Rain. Oh no, yeah, yeah. I mean, the Marab fight you have to do next, and it's crazy. It's gonna be it's gonna be a completely different style of fight than this was. This was, I mean, this was all on the feet. No takedown attempts for any, anybody from either one. And, you know, Marab's going to come in there just trying to get O'Malley down from the get-go. And it's going to be it's going to be really interesting because I think – I personally think Marab's the best fighter in that division right now. Right now, But uh, if O'Malley can keep it on the feet the way he looked tonight, I don't know that Marab can handle that. Though Marab, you know, is very durable, gas tank for days. Yeah. For days, hits hard. But he, he's just – but Sean yeah, just can't. looked – he can't on another stand, level, yeah. He can't stand with him. He yeah, absolutely yeah. can't stand with him. I mean, and I don't think anyone in that division can because between the reach and the um, and the speed, um, you know, and the accuracy, you know, I mean, he's such a complete stand-up fighter. Yep. Yeah, the angles were uh, were awesome. Just changing of stances, changing of levels. Uh, it was it was like a technical uh, masterpiece. Uh, the other news, uh, I guess, is uh, Joanna Jerjechik is. Uh, UFC Hall of Famer. Um, it feels like she just retired, uh, but uh, very deserving so to to go into the Hall of Fame. Ryan, I thoughts? I mean, yeah, you know, one of the greatest women women fighters they've had uh, in involved in the greatest women's fight we've seen today. Today, it's going to be hard to very very hard to pass that fight. And yeah, just absolutely deserving when you look look at the UFC Hall of Fame. You know numerous title defenses was a big star to big star for the for the strawweight division yeah just you know she checks every box that the ufc has when they look at the hall of fame everybody you know i know everybody says oh it's you know early and all that who cares if you deserve it i'm all she, i'm one of those first i'm one of those people if, if you deserve over. it go in but her career's over yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, it's not like it's, it's not like she's in the middle of her career. Career's over, and uh, she's all she's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't argue that too many too many defenses. And in the early days of that division, she was com- she was completely dominant. You know, until she ran into um, you know, I mean, there there were, you know, until she ran into what was a Rose and then uh, Zhang Weilei. But it doesn't matter. I mean, like she went through for years as the dominant force in that division and put the division on the map. She was very charismatic. Yeah. And, and a really fun fighter to watch. Uh, before we get to the rest of the main card, they were pushing UFC 300. Dana was saying in, in the, the little advertisement how it could be the greatest night in MMA history or whatever. I, I mean, as a full show, like up and down the card from the prelims and everything, the show is awesome, but still it's the, a very deep show. The the main pay-per-view is, is uh, a weaker show i i think than than most people w- would probably want but uh i mean kayla you know they, they're bringing in kayla and she's not even on the main card kayla, kayla's like seventh from the top with holly Holm, which which is a very intriguing fight and i still you know i don't i don't think we've talked about this but i have no clue how she's going to make 135 pounds i mean i i think that that was a really bad mistake by ufc and her both to, I mean, this is a woman who, um, you know, I mean, like, would she walk around at 180, 170? No, it's got to be 180, you know, at least from before. And her judo weight was, what was her judo weight? I don't even remember now off the top of my head, but it's over 170. And now you're going to fight at 135? I mean, she had trouble to get to 155 and extreme trouble to get to 145, enough to where she didn't want to go in the tournament at 145 because she didn't think she could cut to get there, you know, so often. And now she's going to fight at 135. Um, You know, I, you know, I mean, I get from a UFC standpoint, you know, every attempt to do something at 145 was a disaster because there was no depth in the thing. There was no depth in the division, but um, yeah, I, I, I thought that like, you know, she should come in at least at 145. Because she's not going to be at her best, at, you know, cutting that much weight. Yeah, yes. it, it just it just seems like it's kind of set up for her 
for a failure coming up for her to to try and make that weight. Like not not not, not only like just missing the weight, but how dangerous! Like it's going to be really dangerous for dangerous. her. Dangerous and and Holly Holm. I mean, Holly Holm is old. You know, she's in her forties. Um, she's well credentialed and a big name, and it's kind of like that is the kind of name that you would put against Kayla Harrison in her debut. You know, someone who is a big name is a former champion. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, it's, it's well past her peak, but when, once you, when you move that, like at 145, I think that that would be a very intriguing fight because at the same time as, as, um, Kayla Harrison is younger in the sport and everything and on her, you know, in theory on her way up, um, you know, she's, she's unproven in other ways too. I mean, she's never, she's never beaten a top class fighter. And she has struggled at times with fighters that are not top class. So we don't really know how good she is. But when you add this, yeah, I think it's the recipe for a very big money, highly publicized debut that, uh, you know, could be a disaster. Maybe more more because of the high chance of not making weight. Or if she does, I mean, I can't imagine what she would even look like at 135 pounds. Is there a possibility that she and Holm have sort of agreed that, you know, they're they're both okay with coming in five to ten pounds over? Last I uh, last I heard, what Holly Holm publicly said was was if she doesn't make the weight, you know, one thirty six, then there's no fight. So wow, well, there you go, yeah. there so, you go. Yeah, I mean, UFC is going to give going to give Kayla, you know, all the help you know as far as you know utilizing all their nutritionists and all their doctors at the performance institute and all that to make sure she gets there and uh she she was doing yeah, a but- Q&A, Q&A and she she did look way less you know filled right now than she typically does a well sure four or five, four she, or five she, yeah but yeah she can't, she can't she can't cut from 180 i mean she's yeah. got to She's got to get to 155, you know, yeah. before she even starts cutting. If she's going to make 135, yeah. So, yeah, that's going to be that's going to be a big thing to watch out for the next month. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but that's that's, that's seventh from the top. I mean, it's the, it's it's one of the deepest, if not the deepest, shows I've seen. But it doesn't have the, like the top two three matches. There have been many 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 shows that have stronger top two three matches. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, it, it it definitely looks that way. But it, it's going to be one of those shows where. Man, I almost want to watch a lot of the stuff on the prelims even more than some some of what's on the. Yeah, main yeah. Part. I mean, I mean, I yeah, yeah. My my thought is, I, I this this is a show where I probably should watch the whole show rather than yeah. just the main card. Yeah, right. And I know there's been a lot of criticism tonight since they announced that the Bo Nickel Cody Brundage fight is going to be on the main card, but I think a lot of people don't get understand it, and they, and if you get it, like they're banking on Bo Nickel to to be yeah. a massive superstar two, three years down, down the line. And you want this exposure. Plus, plus yeah. having, looking at the lineup that, you know, you're going, they're going four hours on ESPN. You have a chance to get a huge, huge viewership num- number with all these fights, you know, put yeah. practically, practically an eight fight pay-per-view card on ESPN. Like that's, you know, that's a big deal right now going into the, going into the TV negotiations. So big, de- big deal. And espe- especially now because, for whatever reason, UFC has gotten super popular. I mean, the the rating on the last um, paper, the last time they were on ESPN, they had a fantastic rating. Yeah. And the other thing with their with their ratings are is that um, it's it's like their their audience is so much younger than any other sport. And I mean, maybe soccer. You know, I haven't checked on soccer lately, but you know, soccer and, and AEW and, and UFC were always the youngest, and AEW has aged up. So it's it, and and UFC is aged down. I mean, it, you know, so it's like it's it's not just a large audience, but it's a very um, advertiser friendly audience. Yeah. And um, you know, so yeah, going into these contract negotiations, and you know, UFC is obviously wanting a big big increase. You know, the one that they're looking for the big increase is it's yes, of course, for the um, the TV rights, but the one that they're really looking for is a big increase for the pay per view rights. And WWE is as well. They're both looking for like they think that that uh, the pay per view both both um, and, um, TKO companies are thinking that the pay per view rights are the ones that they can really go way up more than the TV rights at this point because of the idea that there's a value in these marquee shows 
um, that they're not getting paid at that level for. And, you know, for WWE, it's, it's debatable because quite frankly, if they had to do it on their own, they could not make that money. Whereas for UFC, ESPN is making the money they're paying and more. It's, you know, it's a, it's a big loss for Peacock, but the UFC, because it's on pay-per-view, is a big, you know, money gain for ESPN+. Plus. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about some of those uh, Shapiro quotes. I did listen to the, the interview that, that he had a few, a few days ago. Um, you know, it, is Battle of the Belts and Collision going head up against UFC 300? Yes, right? April 13th, right? Yeah, yikes. What a day, huh? Crazy. Three hours of, yeah, three hours of uh, collision. Yeah, head to head with, uh, what is it? it? You know, like seven hours of UFC, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Probably more Are, like eight, eight with three title fights. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a long day coming. All right, let's talk about the rest of this pay per view show. Uh, Dustin Poirier beat Benoit Saint Denis uh, in the second round by knockout in a fight that. It very much looked like uh, Poye was was going to be the one who who was going to take a beating here. The first round sort of went that way, and he kept going to the guillotine so much so that his corner told him to stop, and he didn't. And it actually was kind of like a a, a faint guillotine at the end, which helped him set up a, a right hand that knocked out Saint Denis. Uh, Ryan, talk about this one. I thought this was the best fight of uh, of the stuff that I saw. It was really yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah, yeah, incredible fight. And Dustin Poirier continues to be one of the most entertaining fighters in UFC history. And I think really what this showed is he's been in so many wars in his career. The Eddie Alvarez fights, the Justin Gaethje fights, Max Holloway, Holloway fight. And then I think he really used that veteran mentality of all those wars to, to know that, you know, Benoit Saint-Denis, Young, you know, hits hard, but also young, young and young in his career. And, you know, a guy who's going to come out trying to finish, finish him really quickly. And then he went you know, really you fast. Saint, yeah. You, you know, you saw St. Denis just pour it on in the first round and nearly finish him, finish him. But by the time two minutes into the second round, you could see St. Denis was tired. Was like, you know, he was already wearing down, down in, in Poirier. Yeah, a little, little tired, but from the beating, but he, it's a position he'd been in his career a ton of times and just, you know, just came out and came out, uh, after he escaped, what, uh, I think it was a choke attempt there in the second round, second round and just battered, uh, St. Denis with some left hands and that right hand that put him down, it's down right. cold. Yeah. It was just, it was a brutal finish and just an incredible fight and fight and Dustin Poirier, uh, I mean, the guy, that guy's on the way to the Hall of Fame and still one of the one of the most popular guys in in the sport and really one of the good guys in the sport too and too and just yeah that was just an incredible fight. Yeah, I um, it's funny because I really do think that that Saint Denis if if this knockout doesn't like you never know how guys respond from a knockout because sometimes sometimes guys look great they get knocked out once and then you start seeing them get knocked out time after time. If he can fully recover from this, I, I think that the guy, the guy, I thought the guy was looking awesome. Yeah. No. But, but yes, he was an experience and that's what, that's what d- did him in. But I could see, you know, I mean, you know, a lot of guys in Poirier's position would have lost that fight, but, but yeah. he's, he is really um, between the strength and the striking, um, you know, and, and, and his, you know, great finishing ability. Um, I think that he's a real danger to to a lot of people and maybe a future title contender or champion. But on this night, it was not his night, you know. He and um, yeah, you know, Poirier um, did not look good in the first round, but he he took his beating and and came back and finished. Yeah, it was a very exciting fight, though. Yeah. And then uh, Michael Venom Page made his UFC debut against Kevin Holland. Won a unanimous decision. You got the full Venom Page experience, the gamesmanship, the striking. Uh, I, I After this fight, I thought the fans are probably going to pay to see him get beat because of the way that he fights. 
Uh, but at the same time, I could see how some folks may think that the way that he fights is, is not that exciting. I was watching uh, with a crowd of about 15 to 20 people, and they were clearly rooting for Holland by the second round because they didn't like what uh, Venom Page was doing. But uh, Ryan, break break this one down. I mean, Holland's a tough guy to finish, but uh, and Page looked like, you know, no matter what you say, he looked like there was a few jitters there, there, you know, just coming in, come in, you know, hyped and get the big debut, debut, and all these eyes are on on you, and you know, he he he's always been one of those. He's either going to finish you quick and it's going to be exciting, or it could go fifteen minutes and and be kind of like this was. And I thought I thought he looked good, good, and you know, it was definitely a good showing and showing from him but uh but yeah you know the people who are criticizing him i mean you know a lot of very clearly a lot of people haven't seen michael page fight fight a lot so this is <laughs> yeah, fight forever yeah i mean yeah, that's, that's, that, that's what he that's, does that's how that's how he fights and and that's his winning style i mean if he didn't fight that way he, he would not be beating people I mean, you know, he's, he fights the point karate style in and gets gets in lands it's very difficult you know, unless you're used to fighting that type of a fighter, it's a really hard style to, to beat, you know, unless you're a, a wrestler who can take him down and Kevin Holland's not that guy. I mean, yeah. in that sense, it was like Kevin Holland was a really good first opponent for him in UFC because he's a striker, but he's completely, you know, law. he's never fought anyone like this and he didn't have the wrestling threat. And um, yeah, the guy's so far away that you can't hit him. And it's, um, it's hard. He, it's, it's a hard style when a guy's good, but you know, I mean, it's a style you can't figure out. Like when Lyoto Machida first started, this was his style very much. And at the beginning, nobody was touching Lyoto Machida. And then eventually they did. And, and wonder boy Thompson, the same way, you know, I mean, and this, this is, I mean, he's different than those two, but it's still, you still got that similarities in the sense that that's the original, um, the original, you know, world that he comes from. And, um, you know, he's a charismatic guy. And, um, but I don't, I don't see him being a champion in UFC, but I see him being a very difficult opponent for anyone, but, but um, anyone, but a fully, you know, you know, a a top five fighter is is probably, probably is going to beat him, but an under, an underneath fighter, it's going to be a hard fight for them. Yeah, I, I had a, I have a group a group uh, text and uh, some some of my buddies who had never seen Michael Page. They asked me what is he like, and I said I said just think of a uh, English Stephen Thompson with a little bit more explosive explosivity, and that's exactly right. what it what it is. Mm-hmm. And and you know they're uh, they're running England. Uh, they're supposed to go Manchester in July. I could easily see the see them putting him in the main event, maybe against Stephen Thompson. You know, kind of a, yeah, yeah, that's kind a, of a that's, styles class. That's, a weird, that's, that's a weird one because they kind of would. That that might be actually a boring fight. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean, it, could I mean, be. it might be like the worst. It might be the worst fight for both of them because <laughs> because yeah. it's, it's it's like they would be you. They each would be used to the style, but yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's like. They'd also be used to the trip, you know. It'd be it'd be a hard fight to be exciting. Yeah, but they, but Page is is still a big star in England, and you know he he's going to headline cards over there over there. So mm-hmm. as long as he can keep winning and keep winning, and so but it was a good show for him, in my opinion. It was it was fascinating to watch him uh, with with the distance because he's so long, uh, long legs, long torso, long arms. And he was just setting up an overhand right that he would just kind of bounce into. Uh, and uh, it, it was, I, I loved watching that, that just his ability to control that, yeah. that distance. But and of course the big ring, ring entrance, you know, coming yes. out of the Undertaker. Undertaker's music. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was what, like, what, 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 what um, were, were there other people bes- was uh, Rhea Ripley and Buddy Matthews were there, right? Please. Say, yes. Yeah. Yes. I saw them. Yeah. I'm trying to think. Was there anybody? Uh, Logan Paul was there with Logan his Paul, title, right? Right, yeah. He had his yeah. title. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. That that's it from I think from the uh, wrestling world that yeah. I saw. Uh, all right, and then uh, Jack uh, Della Maddalena beat Gilbert Burns uh, in the third round by TKO. Um, this was a fight in which uh, Gilbert seemed to be possibly having a, a chance to to win a decision based on a takedown, yeah. and as he tried to progress towards a submission, Della Delena, uh, 
uh, Delhi. Let's just call him Jelly. Or what, what uh, people are calling him, oh, J- JDM. No, <laughs> uh, JDM. Uh, he, uh, he, he slipped out and then he knocked him out. I thought that was a, a terrific knockout and uh, a great way. To, Burns was really messed up at the end of this fight. Yeah, I mean, he was – Burns was a minute and a half away from winning a decision because he was uh, up 2018 on two two cards. But Madalena, uh, JDM, uh, just – I mean, every time he'd get taken down, he would find a way back up. And, and Gilbert Burns is incredible on the ground. And if he can't keep you on the ground, ground it's uh, – you know, while he hits hard, hits hard, I mean, Burns wears himself out trying to – trying to control on the mat and Madalena, he would, just, he was lighting him up on the feet, you know, landing some really good left hands and would follow him with right hooks and working the body body. And then just that, uh, I think it was, was it, it was a knee knee right to the, right to the midsection. I believe that mm-hmm. that knocked, knocked him down and then just pounded away with, with some brutal elbows from the top. And it was a great show for JDM. He's, he's, you know, he's a guy from Australia who's, Got a lot of hype and has looked great so far, and and I really like the fact that they called out Shavkat Rachmanov because that's the one guy that they yeah. can't get get a fight for for in that division, and I, you know, that's that's got to be next for for both of them. I mean, and that's that easily could you know lead to a title shot to whoever wins that one. And then in the opener, we had another fight where kind of the veteran championship savvy one out here. Uh, Piotr Jan beat Song Yedong uh, in the second round. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, wait, what? Wait, what, what no, was it was a the, decision. Uh, decision. Decision, yeah, sorry. sorry. It was, it was was, decision, yeah. Uh, unanimous decision, 29-28 across. Uh, yeah, he won two and three. Uh, in, a, in a round one, I think a lot of people thought, well, you know, he maybe maybe he got old. Maybe this guy, this younger guy, is uh, is going to get it here. But he the last two round. I thought his I thought round two was just an amazing switch from a strategy standpoint, from a understanding what Yudong was doing, and he won that round, and then he won uh, round three to win it. Yeah, that's pretty pretty much it. Yeah, uh, Yudong had a Song Yudong had a strong first round and, and looked looked like you know. I have a lot of questions about Jan because Jan had what I think he'd lost four in a row coming into this the the two Sterling fights and then the O'Malley one O'Malley fight that a lot of people thought he won and then he just got ragdolled by well, and, 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 and one of the Sterling fights he was winning except he got DQ'd yeah, yeah. and then the, the, this, then the rematch he he, he lost yeah. and then uh, yeah like the O'Malley fight um, you know that fight could have gone either way yeah. But then, but then he got ragdolled by Marab a year ago. A year ago, yeah. we haven't seen him since since then. And that first round, you start wondering, is like, okay, did did just did those guys just take away his his will to fight or so, something? You kind of see that whenever you go through the through that slump. But that second round, especially, he really started working the body body with those punches and kicks, and that made the huge different difference. And then got got a Yadong down late cut him open and i think from that from that point on it was just all yawn you know especially in the third round third round and just looked you know turned it on middle middle part of the second round and looked great looked great looked like the po three on that that was you know a champion and just looked looked really good and and yadong's really talented 26 years old Mm -hmm. 26 years old i mean he's gonna bounce back from that one yeah 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 he showed a lot of ability and um but it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't his night. He wasn't quite, uh, mm, I guess, I guess that I, I think he came out too fast also. I think that may have been some of it, but he looked very good in round one. Um, you know, round two, we kind of turned the tide and everything like that. And then uh, as the fight wore on, you know, um, Jan started looking really good. Ryan, was there, what was on the prelims of note? Okay. So anybody who missed this, uh, Robelis Despange, that's a guy everybody needs to needs to watch. I really wish they would have shown shown this on the uh, main card on the main card somewhere because what well, went eighteen seconds. But this is a this is a Cuban Cuban Taekwondo uh, bronze medalist from the Summer Olympics in twenty twelve. Thirty five years old. He's getting a late start, but he's six seven two sixty one. Uh, eighty seven inch reach coming into his fight coming into his debut. 
his last three fights had lasted a combined 19 seconds. Wow. And, uh, and this one, it was 18 seconds and, and he just, uh, he came out just bum rushing Josh Breeson, slipped on a kick and then he was retreating. And then as he was retreating, landed a right hand right to the Josh Breeson and knocked him down and out cold, out cold. It was like, like it's a, you know, we're, you know, we could talk about Nagano here in a second, but it's kind of a shame that Nagano is not in the UFC anymore because this would be a fight that would be like if you watch this, it reminded you a lot of early early Nagano UFC performances, and everybody would be itching for the for that matchup. But but Despange, that's that's a guy to keep an eye on eye on right now, and he's I think he's gonna if they you know promote him, he's gonna be you know a Nagano t- type where everybody's gonna want to watch him when he fights, and then. And then basically the other standout performance is Michelle Pereira. That guy is just an absolute mon- monster. Uh, you know, not uh, landed some brutal body kicks on M- Mikhail Olasechek, and then uh, hit him with a liver punch that hurt him badly. And then and then landed a knee, and then immediately switched to the back, back and got a rear naked choke, choked Olasechek out cold in just over a minute, and Pereira. You know, we've seen him a lot. He's, you know, one of those wacky on the feet guy, uh, guys on the feet does a whole lot of showboating. But when he puts it all together like this, like that's cha- he's championship caliber right there. Um, and then you mentioned Anthony Joshua and Francis Ngannou. They fought yesterday uh, in a fight that did not go the same way that the Tyson Fury fight went for Ngannou. It was a uh, second round knockout and i think um he even knocked him down in the first round as well yeah. uh, and and this wasn't you know this this wasn't joshua doing anything specifically crazy he's just a straight right hand and uh you know joshua's a big strong dude and that was uh that was a, quite the difference maker for Nganu. uh what w- did either of you see this one i didn't see, i didn't see it but i thought that um I always thought that the Naganu Fury fight and everybody, you know, it's like it's like it 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 didn't go the way everyone expected. And when I watched it, I thought it was a lot more that Fury didn't take it seriously and Fury was not in shape for the fight. Not so much that like Naganu instant, oh my god, he's like a a top 5 top top 10 heavyweight boxer, you know, which, you know, I mean he was the first boxer in history to be to get a top ten ranking with an zero and one record, <laughs> you know, in the history of the sport. Because you know he did knock down um, Fury, and I don't think I mean I mean I don't think he really should have won the decision, but it was certainly competitive and it was not one side. But again, I thought it was more because Fury didn't take it seriously, and Joshua, you know, did. And this is this is the reality of it. I mean, Nagano is not a world class boxer. You know, he's an MMA fighter. But this knockout is such that I wonder how. Um, I wonder, you know, going back into MMA after this kind of a knockout, you know, how he's going to do, um, you know, against whatever it is, Henan Ferreira. Is that the you yeah. know the guy? Yeah, everyone gets yeah. In the fight? yeah. Her and, and Henan Ferreira is every bit as big as. Nagano yeah. and Anthony Joshua with knockout power, power and and yeah, I agree about the Tyson Fury thing. Like Tyson definitely didn't take that he, seriously. He thought, it was, and, he thought it was an easy payday. It was an easy payday, and it was it was ba- and I feel like he felt like it was like an official kind of sparring setup because he had that Usk fight scheduled for what like two months after right. afterwards. So, yeah, he didn't so take it serious. I mean. So he didn't take it serious. I mean, you know, that he was going to get that, and that was going to ba- basically be the start of where of his training camp. Whereas Anthony Joshua, like nothing, nothing booked in the future. His f- sole focus was on the on this fight, and and yeah, just I mean, it just showed there's there's levels in this boxing game, boxing game, and you know these fighters, the the these MMA fighters, they they you know. <laughs> They should stick to what they're good at, and the same thing. Everybody goes just like, goes just like, well, now these boxers need to try to MMA. The MMA doesn't pay <laughs> enough. Gonna, guys gonna like Brian well. Garcia, and, <laughs> and, and they won't do well. But I mean, they don't need to worry because yeah. they're not going to get the paydays that we, they get. But yeah. Uh, but yeah, and but then yeah, you know, it, it's. I mean, the same look thing at look at um, 
Look at, look at um, 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 oh God, um, the, the the Clarissa Shields. Yeah, I mean Clarissa Shields is is the dominant woman boxer in the world, and she was in there with like you know set up women and 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 struggles. Yeah. yeah, only reason she's doing even sniffing around MMA though is because there's not that much money in women's boxing. Yeah, but uh, she's a but she's a real skilled boxer. It's not like you know, I mean, and and I mean, and a great athlete, and you know, she's umpteen times the athlete of the people that she's fighting in MMA. But she's struggling at it because she, you know it's it's a different it's it's a different world. Yeah, the the it's Fury just... thing. Uh, I right. thought the Fury thing was. He watched Mayweather and McGregor and saw yeah. how Mayweather carried Connor, but he got he just got tired because he was not in shape. And by at that by that point, he was just open for getting hit. But he did predict he actually predicted Joshua would knock Ngannou out in the first round, uh, and it happened in the second round. So he kind of knew that you know probably what Ryan said that Joshua was pretty serious about this thing. Yeah. Uh, you know what I would do though if I was Ngannou. I would still fight one more fight in boxing because Deontay, Deontay Wilder, he lost his last fight in, in kind of embarrassing fashion. And uh, that would be a wild, you know, because Deontay Wilder hit the, the talk about him is that he doesn't really have the boxing skills. He just has the long arms and, and the power. And so I think somebody would would talk themselves in, into putting that fight together. And then after that, there's really nothing else out there for Ngannou at the heavyweight level. Uh, Usyk is just a different level. Like it wouldn't even, I don't mean, it wouldn't even be interesting because he he's so much better. And then if he wants to go back to MMA, then, you know, then he's made his money or he doesn't have to go back to MMA because he's made his money. But that would be, uh, that would be my thought on, on what he could do next. Yeah. Uh, all right, so the next time we will all real, 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 real quick because I, I do want to bring this up because it is such a weird thing on Thursday morning when I woke up and they actually announced Mike Tyson against Jake. Oh yes, <laughs> um, which is you know the ultimate of, of of freak weirdo fights. You know what I mean in in every single way, um, and and it's actually one where I do think you know a lot of these ones like like I don't know my gut is is that. Um, was the was the Joshua fight even like a pay per view? Because it's Friday afternoon, right? That's- it was on. It was on DAZN. I think it was forty bucks if you had a DAZN subscription. Yeah, Something only, like only DAZN, or I think it was only DAZN. Okay, yeah, because, because, yeah. because because I don't expect that that did much business at all. Um, Jake Paul and Mike Tyson, I actually think will do a pretty decent amount of business because the last time Mike Tyson fought, they did over, you know, what, like a million pay-per-view by some That's absolutely nice. insane number. Well, and, is it, isn't it just on Netflix? So they're not, they said they're not charging for it. Um, yeah, it's on Netflix, so, but I think that it's going to be, I think the audience is going to be gigantic. Yeah. Um, I wonder how much it's costing Netflix to do this, but then again, Netflix has money. So it doesn't, you know what I mean? It's like, I don't, you know what I mean? It's like, they want to do it, but yeah, this no, I think a, yeah, it, this is like a rich person's experiment. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, they're just doing it for the data. Like, who's who's out there who wants to watch this stuff? We're yeah. we're paying for and, data and, and demographics, and, 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 and it's and it's their first, uh, or so it would be their second live sport event. I guess it kind of depends on what you consider sport, yeah. Because they they've done some like uh, F one universe events. Uh, where the the drive to survive folks they all get together and play golf or something and then yeah they they did a uh, uh, I think they had a golf event that was live recently they've done a uh, Chris Rock live comedy special but the one that they failed at was their reality show they were gonna do a live reunion and it just didn't work for like an hour so that was like the one where they 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 had to pull back a little bit but yeah I mean this is also just kind of like. I'm sure a test for for Raw coming in January. Sure, to make sure that that you can handle the the traffic. Yeah, at, at all all t- tuning in at one point because yeah, and and it will be gigantic. You know, it'll, it'll it'll be way bigger than a Raw. So if they can pull this off, at least they know you know what they can you know for for the early weeks of Raw what they can you know expect. Depending 
how serious Jake Paul and Mike Tyson are, they should do some sort of preview kind of lead up a couple weeks up into the the fight to, to kind of just remind people that it's coming. And also because you're also seeing, you know, if you are doing some of this stuff with uh, WWE internationally and, you know, lots of shoulder programming and stuff, you, you just see what the appetite is for that stuff too. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it's interesting because obviously, you know, you know, I mean, um, Mike Tyson's a real heavyweight, you know, Jake Paul usually was going against non-boxers, that were MMA fighters that were also smaller and older than he is. Now with Tyson, it's way older than he is, but it's an actual boxer, you know, who, and you know, when, when Mike Tyson fought Roy Jones, I mean, he didn't look bad, you know, no. for, for his age, but he's also several years older, you know, and, 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 you know, it's, you know, I mean, it's, 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 Whatever it is. And, you know, again, 55-year-old boxers usually don't do very well. <laughs> so are they considering this an exhibition? Probably. Because, you know, the weight, the weight itself is going to be an issue. I guess Jake could eat his way up to heavyweight or something. But... Well, I don't. I mean, I don't imagine it's going to be drug tested either. <laughs> no, I do not it's, imagine it'll be drug tested. I mean, it, it, it's in Texas. I'm, not, I'm sure it won't be <laughs> drug tested. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> might, as well, right. might as well go. It's thirty minutes away from my. house I was about to say you got to think about getting credentialed for this one. Yeah, thirty minutes from my house. Might as well go. <laughs> I, I and it's a J. It's a Jake Paul production as well. So I'm sure. I don't yeah. even know who he markets as as his fighters. I know yeah, the Serrano sisters are, are are with him, uh, but he. I'm sure he's going to get some people on his shows on, on the undercard. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's, it's fifty percent Jake. Uh, Netflix and fifty percent MVP promotions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and all then, right. And, and then uh, one other thing, one other thing, UFC thing. Uh, they did announce Ultimate Fighter thirty two. Uh, right. Alexa Grasso, Valentina Shevchenko as the coaches starts June fourth on ESPN, and uh, that, that sets up. What's on ESPN? Two. Yeah, it's gonna be on ESPN, and uh, not ESPN Plus. Wow. No, yeah, no ESPN, and then uh, which because the last season. The last season with Connor did not draw good ratings on ESPN, and obviously neither of these women are Connor. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't. It's it's summertime. I don't think. The, I mean, there's no sports outside of baseball going going on. I don't think ESPN has programming on Tuesday night, so it makes sense to just throw it on there, throw it on there. Mm-hmm. But uh, but uh, looks looks like that timeline sets them up to fight at the Sphere show. The so right so, September sixteenth yeah. or whatever it is yeah. the mid so, September, yeah. So yeah, they're gonna have to charge like double their top price to make money on that show, aren't they? You would think. I don't. I don't, I don't know. Be, yeah, it's gonna be a very expensive ticket. Yeah, to make money at that place. Yeah, it's insane. Um, I mean, maybe, all right, uh, maybe, so maybe they, maybe they get John Jones's return there, so that you know to justify the the ticket prices, you know. So yeah, so it'd be Jones and Stepe. Yeah, yeah, that's probably what what it is that that, ma- that makes like. sense. That makes sense for that show. Yeah, if he's if John's ready, which he should be by then. Yeah, yeah. So we'll be back for UFC 300 the next time we do this. And uh, Ryan, remind everybody where they can find you on uh, social media and such. So, I mean, Twitter on uh, uh, Ryan J Frederick, and then of course, you know, I'll be recapping everything in the in the Observer newsletter each and every week and then on the front page each and every week live coverage of the shows all right thanks ryan yeah, and uh we'll, we'll see you in about five weeks <laughs> yep see y'all then all right uh all right dave so i guess we're gonna talk we're gonna try and get through the rest of this stuff we got a lot to talk about uh what is the new uh, we're probably not gonna have time to recap all of collision and, and smackdown but what what were the big things that came out of collision um, let's see. Um, Jericho beat Teton. Teton looked good. Um, they did a street fight with the House of Black against Jeff Jarrett, Mark Briscoe, and Jay Lethal, where Mark got put through a flaming table and lost. So I think they might be setting up maybe a ring of fire match, a ring surrounded by fire match type of a thing or something with them. Um, it was. You know, there was, it was one of those matches that you get on AEW all the time where they didn't do thumbtacks, but they did a whole bunch of tables and now fire. And, I mean, 
it was well, you know, Malachi Black looked really good, and and Jay Briscoe. I mean, Mark Briscoe's got a lot of, um, you know, a lot of uh, people really, really like him, and it was a good match. But you know, again, I'm, you know, they did do it too much. Is basically what I would say. I mean, it's, so it didn't really move me or anything. It was kind of like oh, I've seen it, but but they work hard. I mean, they work really hard, and it was it was very well wrestled. They. Um, the Young Bucks and Okada did a squash where the Young Bucks never even tagged in. Okada just came in, did three or four moves. Great drop kick, Rainmaker, and that was it. And then um, Penta came in first. And then, um, um, what was it? Uh, um, well, Eddie Kingston came in first. Then they were beat down. They beat it. Penta, Eddie Kingston came in first. They beat him down. Penta made the save. They beat him down. And the final save was Pac. And Pac cleared the ring of the Young Bucks and ended up with Pack and Okada, and they did a really cool sequence, and the Young Bucks pulled Okada out of the ring. So we got a six-man, Young Bucks and Okada against Eddie Kingston, Penta, and Pack for Wednesday, which is a loaded-up show, and, you know, building up to Okada and uh, Eddie Kingston, I think, on the pay-per-view. Uh, uh, elephant in the room here, but I said, was was Pack coming back from an injury? Because he looked so much smaller compared to the yeah. last time I saw him. He's ripped, but yeah, he's he's lighter for sure. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. He's been out for like seven months or something like that. He's been out for a long, long time. I, I also saw Danielson and Osprey had an interview segment. I didn't get to actually hear it. I had to read the subtitles because I was I was watching it between the fights uh, uh, on UFC, but that you, you had reported already in the observer that that match was done anyway. So they, 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 it's basically um, Danielson does his match with Shane Taylor, which was a really good match. And um, you know, one, and then Osprey comes out and the crowd very into Osprey and he's just, you know, complimenting Danielson and uh, you know, basically, you know, just putting him over and then, uh, you know, um, he just goes, I think you probably have something you want to say to me, you know, because Danielson came out and he goes, yeah, you know, um, basically challenged him to match on April 21st and said, they said like, you know, you're the best in the world and to prove you're the best in the world, you know, you got to face me. And, you know, they were completely cordial. It was not a baby face heel thing. They may, they may have Danielson try to be a, a baby. I mean, a heel, you know, in the next week or two, you know, I mean, as they do all the time, but this was a total respect, total sportsmanship thing. And, um, you know, it's a match that to the people who want to see it, um, to that audience, I mean, it's one of the biggest matches you could ever do. Um, I think it's, you know, Danielson's coming off a bunch of losses, but you know what, guess what, to the people who are into this type of thing, they know Danielson can lose hundred matches in a row. They know how good he is. Well, which actually takes me, to the Shane Taylor match because I thought it was really good. And I thought I was like, man, Taylor better get something out of this because he looked awesome in this match. Taylor, and, Taylor's been looking really good in his matches. Yeah. And at the same time, I thought for building, you know, uh, to your top match or second to the top match or whatever for the pay-per-view, I almost felt like Danielson gave way too much in this match. But like you said, well, it's different. It you know what? everyone, everyone's got the theories. I mean, in the old days, um, the top guys would go on TV against jobbers and sell 80% of the time and then beat them. And that's, that's what top guys did, um, especially heels. So then you got, you know, I mean, in, in, you know, we got, we've got kind of educated to a different way, but, it's not, it's, you know, I grew up, I grew up on the top guys selling like crazy for jobbers going into the Cal Palace main event. That's, that was our style. So it doesn't bother me. And, and Ric Flair made a career of that, you know, so, and Harley Race did not as much as Ric Flair, but still to a degree, always, you know, giving stuff to the underneath guys and, and he was the world champion. So I don't, that doesn't really bother me at all. You know, when people go, Oh my God, you know, like Brian Danielson gave blah, blah, blah. And it's like, he's still Brian Danielson. You know, it's like, it's like, you know, I mean, and, and he's one who we can even lose a lot. Now I do think he's lost some luster by losing so many. And I, that's why I thought he should beat Nanny Kingston, but I get where they're going. If the, if the mentality is, is we're getting a triple crown on Okada, 
um, then Eddie Kingston should have beat Brian Danielson. And again, Brian Danielson will Osprey to the people who want to see that match. The fact Brian Danielson's lost a bunch of matches doesn't hurt it at all. It's still you're going to see the spectacle of Will Ospreay and Brian Danielson. So in that case, it doesn't, you know, I mean, it's, you know, to the, to the, whatever the masses are, or whatever, but there, I don't think that those people are so much buying AEW pay-per-views anyway. I think the AEW pay-per-view audience is much, much more into the fact. And I think the consistency of their numbers, even though it's different people, it's, it's very much the idea of we're going to get a fucking great show. And that's why I think that their pay-per-view numbers have held up. Whereas so you know, TV numbers, you know, certainly on Friday. Yeah, Saturday. We, we, we can talk about that rating in a second. Um, do you, Okada and that belt is, is an interesting one for me because the new Japan strong title is kind of intertwined with that whole thing. Right. And, when, and ring when, of honor. And ring of honor. Yeah. And so, and so when I think of it that way, I'm like, like, why would Okada care? But if you really want to get that belt over, uh, and you know, and if Okada wins it, you can sort of treat it as like the secondary world title just because of sure, his status. But, but the thing, the thing on this is, is like, I mean, I, I cannot see bring Okada in and having Eddie Kingston beat him. Now. Yes. Yes. I mean, I don't even. It doesn't even make sense to me. So, especially like, after tonight. <laughs> yeah. The, the the young bucks were laughing on the apron. I was cracking up. Yeah, but I mean, it's like it's like um, yeah, it does. It, you know, again, like before, I thought like yeah, they should put Brian Danielson over and elevate that belt. But in a sense, they don't have to. If they were going to go with Okada, you know, Okada's got more time to go in AEW, so if you're going to make someone and also make the belt, I mean, you could put that thing on Okada and have him defend it for a year. Yeah, so, that's yeah. that's that would make sense to me. And 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 it becomes as valuable as a world title, I think. Right. If Okada has it, you know, especially because he's going to be defending it against good people, because they're loaded with good people, and he's going to have great matches, you know, with these good people. So, it's almost like you've got, you know, two world title matches to go along with everything else that you got on these, these, these pay-per-view shows. But does it basically, it takes the title away from ROH though, right? Well, he, he should defend it on ROH shows, but that's, just, you know, there's no reason not to. It's because I, I mean, when's the last time Kingston was on, I guess he'll be on the, the April show. I'm pretty sure he's on the next one. Yeah. 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 Um. All right. What else? Uh, what else did I write down? So the tag tournament starts next week on right. collision. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully we'll have brackets on Wednesday. Yeah, that would be nice because then we can do March Madness like the NCAA does March Madness. By the way, this is not related to wrestling, but, uh, you know, I, I've been filling out NCAA brackets probably since I was like 10 years old, like just because college basketball was always so huge. But for the first time ever in my life, I'm following the women's tournament more than I'm following the men's tournament. I know more women really in, uh, in, in NCAA basketball right now than I know of the guys because I follow, I used to follow men's college basketball, but then it just became sort of like, Oh, because of the NBA. And now the, the, the players don't even really become stars in the NBA because they kind of skip college now. And with the Warriors getting a, a WNBA team next year, um, I'm way more interested in, in, in the woman's side, but uh, Caitlin Clark, for those of you who, oh, I know who are, wa- are watching for ratings, uh, she is, she, she drew an insane number. Uh, I think it was last weekend. She did like over 4 million or something for, for a game. So that's pretty impressive this, in this day and age. That's for sure. Uh, okay. So uh, coming out of SmackDown was uh, the match for WrestleMania night. One is a, is a done deal. They set it up. Uh, Cody got his slap back on Dwayne right before the show went off of air. And uh, Dwayne said that uh, Cody was a mistake because his brother and sister were 20 years older than him when uh, I think his sister's only a few years older than him. Yeah. Uh, but what did you think of that whole segment? Yeah, I thought it was really good. But I I, um, I saw Dwayne's interview with uh, in the Mesquite Rodeo Arena. With the cowboy hat? With a cowboy hat, trying to be Daniel Rodimer or something. <laughs> so it was very, very similar in some ways. Uh, much better, obviously, you know. But um, 
yeah, you know, I mean, I thought he did a, I thought he did a real good promo, but it was a babyface promo. <laughs> but yeah, he was calling fans crybabies. I guess not a hundred percent babyface, but I'm watching this Christmas just there, and uh, yeah, he know. seems like he's having he's so having, much fun. He's having fun. He's having fun. He's having. He loves the business. He's having the time of his life. Um, yeah, yeah. He's clearly having fun, and uh, looks like. Uh, I mean, the, the thought is, is this is not going to be his only match this year. So, you know, whether it's Saudi Arabia, whether it's SummerSlam, I mean, he's probably going to wrestle Roman Reigns, you know, coming off of this. That, that's always been the plan. I think he's probably going to do a singles match with Cody, probably. If Cody wins the title, I can easily see them doing that match. I, uh, I, almost, I, I would almost, it almost makes more sense. Like, I think some people expect the you know the rock to turn babyface after wrestlemania but if you can stretch, if it's you can stretch this out yeah and he does face cody at SummerSlam, and then you do the turn at SummerSlam for roman and rock to to at the next wrestlemania i think that makes a lot of sense and it just keeps the hot act of the bloodline going much longer than i think people even realize that it could go especially if you if you're if you're doing it with him involved yeah Plus, there's so many different ways that you can do it. You know, I mean, I could come up with 10 different ways of, of getting there. You know, especially like you could do many different results in that tag match, depending on where you're going. You know, if you're going with Cody as champion, you could have you could have Rock pin Cody. Everyone will be pissed. Cody then wins the title. They forget why they're pissed. And then you got Rock and Cody, you know, in a match for the championship. Um, and Roman can get involved in that in some form. Um, but you know, there's, you know, you could have whatever. I mean, I, I think that Roman and rock should win that tag match. Yes, and, I do too. And that, uh, Cody should win. And, and I think Cody should be beating Roman Reigns. So, I mean, there's, there's, um, I think it's going to be, and it's going to be gigantic. Obviously it's good. It's going to be gigantic. Yeah. Mercedes, uh, the big business show though. Did you hear, uh, I think it was Wade Barrett during the Logan Paul, promo where he talked about prime getting the center spot of the ring for the first time ever uh wade barrett used the phrase big business but speaking of big business mercedes they're, they're having the the huge dynamite on wednesday and then i don't know i don't know the context of this quote i just saw the quote out there where she said that she's i, I saw it yeah. she's gonna she, she believes that she'll be in wwe again yeah yeah uh, I, the I thought, timing of that quote was interesting. <laughs> like, why? Why? I mean, she's just. I'm sure she was asked, and she's just being honest. She, she, like, she was asked, and she gave an answer. But I thought that the here's the deal. I think that she should believe that, but I also think that it is very disrespectful because if you put the shoe on the other foot, let's just say that someone. Let's just say. You know, but they wouldn't be st stupid enough, if, if that's the word, or they wouldn't be disrespectful enough or whatever. It's like, what if they sign? What? Let, let, let's just say. I mean, you can use let, Cody, well, Cody say, as the example. Cody, well, Cody, yeah, but Cody would never do this. But let's just say, let's just say Ricky Starks, okay, goes to WWE. Okay, finishes up with AEW, goes to WWE. I'm throwing out a name and 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 all that. And a week before he goes, he go, you know, they go like, "You ever going to go back to AEW?" And he goes, "Oh yeah, for sure." It's like those guys in WWE would have a fit; they'd go crazy. And I'm sure Tony is going crazy because you know, for that he will never show it because she's such a big star, and he's never gonna he will never say something against his stars. But he's got to be. And again, it's like. Um, you know, the whole thing with, with her from day one, I always said like, look until she signs, because, you know, she went back, you know, for all that talk and everything like that, the fact is she did negotiate to go there. And like, there are people who would go Brian and Danielson, you know, Claudio, there's different people who, who would go, um, Moxley is another one who would go to AEW, Will Ospreay, you know, maybe Okada to a degree who would go to AEW because one of the things in AEW is, is that you have the chance to do much better matches. And if that's part of your life, look, 
you're going to make, like I always tell people, you're going to make, if you're someone at that level, it doesn't matter which side you go to, you're making a lot of money, you know? And if you're making 2 million a year in one place and somebody else offers you three or something, and you're going to be miserable at three and you're going to be happy and having the greatest match of your life at two. It's like, you're not stupid for taking the two because if you're rich, that doesn't mean you're going to be happy. But if you're rich and happy, that's a great thing to be. If you're rich and miserable, you might as well be poor because you're not happy. <laughs> and I think people will sometimes go, oh, you got to go with the money. And it's like, yeah, all things being equal. But, you know, if you're working more days and you're whatever, you go where you go where the place that you're going to be happy. Um, but none of these people would go like Brian Danielson. You know, look, Brian Danielson liked Vince McMahon, may still like Vince McMahon. I don't know what he thinks of him today because everyone's view on Vince is different now than then. But, you know, admired I'm not, I'm not sure I'd put those words in his mouth at this point, though. Yeah, yeah. He, he's really close to that situation, I guess. Yeah, well, he hasn't said anything, nor you know, and I don't expect that he will. But um, if he, when he signed with AEW, when he signed, you know, when he said, look, I, you know, some people came here because they didn't like it there. I will not say that because I love I loved it there, but I wanted to come here. And he had his reasons. He wanted to have exactly what he's getting. This is what he wanted out of wrestling. And he's getting it. And he's happy. You know, so I've seen him like with when he was in the ring with O'Connor and he was in the ring with Zach. And the guy's so happy. This is what he wanted out of his life. He ain't going to go in there and go like, oh, yeah, of course I'm going to go back to Vince someday. Or I'd like to go back or expecting like it. You don't say that. And she did. And it's because, you know, whatever, whatever reason she is her reasons but the fact is even jericho never said it and jericho also you know when AEW started he took that tony khan offer and he went to vince and, and said like vince this is my offer you know and and had every intention of staying with vince if vince matched it you know because it was about with jericho it was about money mm -hmm. and vince goes go there you know, and then 10 days later, he goes, oh, I didn't really mean it. Can you go? <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll match it. I'll match it. Like, you know, it's like Vince thinking like Jericho's doing a bluff, not thinking he'd ever go. And it's like, oh, yeah, I've already signed. But the point is, is that he never went in there and went, oh, yeah, I'm going to go back and go back for the Hall of Fame. And he may very well. We all know it's very possible. Yeah, else. sure. You know, and there's nothing. He should. Else. He should at least do the Hall of Fame. Well, yeah, I expect him to do the Hall of Fame. But I mean, as far as like. Whatever he's going to do, you know, he's going to do. But the point is, he never went in there and said that publicly. I mean, privately, of course, I figure someday she's going back. Mm -hmm. And but this was not the week to say that. You know, I just think it takes, you know, again, like. The, the worst thing AEW needs is the idea that these people are here because Tony offered them a whole bunch of money, but their heart is somewhere else. Yeah. Plus. If that's the case, those people are not beneficial to AEW at all. I mean, she'll be beneficial to a degree, you know, to a degree because of her star power. But in the long run, um, you know, we've seen people come in and they get the big reaction. And the ones that want to go back, um, you know, and they make it clear, you know, number one, in a lot of cases, Tony stops really wanting to push them for that very reason. Um in her case, that's not going to be the case because she's making so much money, he's going to have to. And she's so much of a bigger star than all the women there that she's going to deserve it. She's going to be most over. But it's one of those things where, I don't know, I just was, uh, I didn't think that was very uh, politically smart. But, you know, she'll probably be able to get away with it. And But there's people there, you know, that are, I don't know, the word skeptical, but it's one of those things where, you know, you're going to look for that thing. And the thing is, Tony's not going to confront her because that's not his type. But the last thing they also need is someone running over Tony and getting everything they want, um, because that's another issue. So um, it, it changes the dynamic. But, yeah, I mean, she hasn't even been there and she's already talking about it. And Man, I don't know. I don't. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely saw it as like a very honest answer to it's an honest uh, answer i mean I, I don't i don't disagree with the sentiments i just think it's not the week you say it publicly yeah that that it, it the timing of that wasn't fantastic um the rating i think a lot of people are disappointed in in the overall number of yeah. the rating coming out of the pay-per-view and also having osprey's first match 
under the AEW umbrella on television uh, he, uh, in addition to the pay-per-view match. And then, you know, they didn't say that Okada was necessarily going to show up, but he also shows up. That that actual segment was was the biggest one uh, of the night. But uh, overall, what were your thoughts on that rating? Oh, I wasn't surprised they didn't advertise much. You know, it's like um, coming off of the pay-per-view, you know, it really was a great pay-per-view, but we've seen time and time again, AEW's done great pay-per-views, and then they come back Wednesday, and the next Wednesday, and the rating isn't necessarily good. So there's not – it's unlike WWE where – although the la- this last one was a, was a, was not the case. But in most cases with a WWE pay-per-view, especially a big one, the rating's monstrous the next, the next Monday. It hasn't been the case for AEW for whatever reason. So um, they didn't advertise much, and, you know, Will Ospreay – it's Kyle Fletcher in the main event. Yeah. And it's like, man, they had, a, they had a fantastic match. Absolutely fantastic. One of the best matches on AEW TV ever. But it's Kyle Fletcher. You know, it's like he's – the people don't see him as a big star. Um, he's a great wrestler, and hopefully this helps him. You know, I mean, I know he's had other great matches there, but hopefully this really helps him because he's – and all that. But, you know, you've got they've got so many great wrestlers that having a great match in – Losing that, and, and, you know, they don't always follow up on people's momentum, and, and you can't always with everyone because of so many people that you're, you got. But um, I was disappointed, but I wasn't shocked. You know, I mean, if this week's show does badly, you know, and, and I, again, yeah, Oakland, there's so, no way. I don't think there's a way. Yeah, yeah. Show but 0.27 oh, oh, oh oh is, oh, but here, here's the other thing. Again, you're, you're, you know, the, the number is, what it is based on what everything else does. And it's like, they were head to head with the NBA. The NBA did an 0.30. They did an 0.27. If you're that close to the NBA, it's really pretty good. I mean, it's like, yeah, you know, like, would it be better if it was an 0.29? They have beaten the NBA head to head. At times you can do it, but it's like, they still on Wednesday, you know, they have, there's basically, there's the Real Housewife show, which on a bad night, Real Housewives can beat them, and they beat Real Housewives, you know. They were still well up from, you know, their lead-in. They, um, you know, challenge was to a, a much lower number. I, I know it's a reunion and stuff, but, but I mean, there's a certain number of shows there on Wednesday that are, that are competition, and how did they do against them? And they actually did very well. So it's a, it's a you know, the news the news shows were up because of the day after Super Tuesday. Yep. So it's like, it's like, it's, I, it's, it's like, at first you look at it and go, yeah, it's not really a good number. But then, you know, two days later when I looked at everything else on the charts, actually the next day when I saw what the NBA did and when I saw those other shows did, it's like, it's fine. It's not a bad number. And they didn't advertise. They, there's, there was nothing on that show. It's like, if it was like Sting's Farewell and they did a big Sting celebration and they did that number, I would have been disappointed. But they didn't do that. It's Will Ospreay. Yes, it's his first match, but it's not a match that people were dying to see. And nobody knew about Okada. So, you know, you didn't get anything on that. And Okada himself, he's been on the show before. Okada's not a ratings mover. You know, he might turn out to be in time. And Will Ospreay might turn out to be in time once people get to know him. But the the idea of those people being, you know, big ratings movers, it's going to take time. Some of them will make it and some of them won't. Um, You know, you just... It's and, and and if you don't, you know, someone goes, they need to spend more time on the guys who do ratings and less time on the other things. But it's like sometimes you have to sacrifice. And if you never sacrifice to make to put new people in big spots, you're doomed to failure. You're 100 yeah. doomed to failure because nothing will last forever. So you have to be building and you have to put Will Ospreay out and present him in a certain way, which is these great matches and make him special. And week one, you know, it's like that's not going to be. The answer, you know, in, in, in a, you know, the idea is to make him Kenny Omega, you know, and if that happens, um, you know, then, then they'll be fine. Um, so I thought when, when I saw, when I watched Dynamite, it was my, great. It, I thought it was a great show, by the way. My initial thought was, I wonder if just the fact that Will Ospreay is having a great match on television is going to, hold the audience from the previous segment. Well, it won't with Kyle Fletcher. It didn't. Okay, and I think there were also two breaks instead of just one in that segment. Yeah, well, that, so that's that going to hurt it as well. That doesn't help either. Absolutely. And, and I just thought, you know, I was like, you know, 
there, there's a way to do this for him because I think this is a very unique situation. The guy is arguably the best wrestler today. Um, <laughs> More than today. I never, I've never seen anybody better than him. And it's funny because, uh, you know, I heard, I heard from Flair and, you know, was, he, didn't, he didn't say he was the greatest of all time, but he just said he couldn't believe what he saw. Yeah. Which is not, he's never said that to me about Kenny Omega, who he's seen and thinks is fantastic, or, uh, you know, anyone that I can remember, you know, not even Sean, you know, you know, you know but whatever, you know, um, you know, in Steamboat, I heard was the same way. It's like this guy, he's he's got the chance to be the best bell to bell wrestler of all time. So the, th- the, the thing is, it's like he, he doesn't have a big name in the United States today. Right, right. It's going to take time. It's it's going to take time. There's to some people he has it, but not to the thing. But the thing is, is that like he was in this match, and and what do you, do you want him to do? A nine minute nothing happening match where he takes seventy percent. That's not going to be his specialty. That's not what's going to get him over. Matches like this will get him over, but it ain't going to be week one that it happens. It's going to be, it's going to take time. You know, people are going to have to see him do this. Like the people saw the pay per view in this match, they're wow, 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 right? But it's still going to take time. It took, you know, Bret Hart years and years and years and years. It took Shawn Michaels. I mean, you know, and and they never really got all the way, but you know whatever. And Shawn Michaels, years and years and years. If you had, if you took the first, uh, the second time Shawn Michaels was on WWE television, he wasn't a big deal either for a long, long time. Not even a big deal as a singles for years and years. So it's like, it's it's this is something that you're doing to pay off a year from now when he wins the world title and all this. It's not going to be week one. If you expect him to walk in in week one and 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 you know do a big, big number that that's, Hey, if that happens more power to you. But the reality is, is that eight weeks out of 10 dynamite, the final segment is going to be lower because yes. that's the ratings pattern, just like raw, you know, it's like somehow if, if will Osprey debuted in the main event on raw against, um, who would I say they wouldn't, I mean, the point is, it's like Apollo Cruz, right? Um, um, but they went 20 minutes and had an awesome match. It it number one, it, WWE would never have done that match in the main event. But if it did, it would not do well in the main event segment. However, that doesn't mean that you throw Will Ospreay out because the fact is, is plenty of Cody Rhodes and uh, Seth Rollins matches in that last segment have not done well because that's the ratings pattern. I, I just wonder if um, it's one of those. You know, he should be, I think, and a lot of people see this as, you know, sooner than rather than later, he should be the guy. Um, and but, he should, but he, should be, he should be today building to be the guy right from, from day one. Do you think the presentation and the track suit and all that, like that's naturally him, but he did not, he was not presented as like a guy who what was this giant star versus how other folks have been presented like MJF in the suits and such. Like I saw Will and no, I was like, no, no, I mean, there's, 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 no, there's something to that. There's something to that. Um, I mean, when he comes out, he's got the great out, you know, he's got the cool outfit and everything like that, but yes. Um, you know, could they do vid- more video packages and could they present, you know, like, yes, he's out there. The announcers, did they put them over strong? Yes, they did. Um, but, you know, yes. Could he pre- be presented stronger? Yes, of course he could. Um, I think promo wise, I think people didn't like his promos. Um, the crowd reacted to him very big, which is good. You know, sometimes it takes time to do that. They did, but they really reacted big. They're gigantic at the pay-per-view, but they still reacted good in Atlanta. So that's a good one in the sense that to the people paying, he's already there. The thing is, is that to the people watching on TV, um, they're going to need to know more about him. But yeah, they should be doing personality profiles on him. They should be pushing him. He should be talking about the world title today. I'm here to win the one major world title and then have him go chase this thing for months. Don't give it. Don't give him the shot next month. And when it when it comes that time, the people will be ready for it. 
Um, I mean, that's the idea is to get there. You know, I mean, even Eddie Graham with Jack Briscoe, you know, who, you know, it's still, it was still, uh, you know, in the, I'd have to look up how long, but it was probably over a year in the territory before he started becoming, you know, that world title guy. And and he was, Will Ospreay is kind of in, in the same vein to me as, as Jack Briscoe in Florida, you know, when Eddie Graham created Jack Briscoe. Uh, what's the update on the pay-per-view buys? Um, 170 to one, I guess 170, 175 is probably a good range right now. I mean, I'll have a lot better read next Thursday, but TV was up 26%. Streaming was up 25%. The last show did 141. So if you want to go 25% of that, um, you're actually like 176, 175, but international was not up as much. So I would say 170 is probably a pretty good bet for today, but it could be a little higher, maybe a little lower, depending on late buys. But my gut tells me late buys will be better than usual, not worse. So we'll see. Um, successful. But, you know, this one, again, like like I know some people like look and go like, oh, my God, look at the fantastic merch numbers, second biggest merch numbers in the history of the company. They did um, one of the biggest um, attendances ever in North America. Um, and one of the biggest gates they've ever done, you know, not the biggest, but one of the biggest ones they've ever done in North America. So it's kind of like, um, wow, great, fantastic. But it was a fluke. If it was like, if April 21st did these numbers, I'd go, oh my God, they've turned it around. Yes. This, yes. Is, this is this thing's last match. It doesn't, it doesn't, I don't say it doesn't count, but it kind of doesn't. In, in, in fact, in reading where the company is, it doesn't like this pay per view doesn't tell you anything other than if it had done 140, I would have been very disappointed. Right. You know. You know. You just go like, oh, Sting's last match, and it just did normal numbers. It did go way up. That's good. It was a super successful show, but it needed to be a super six. If it wasn't a super successful show, it would be sad, and it would not be. Uh, you know, it would be great. So it's fine. Now the next step. Um, you know, Boston's going to do well. If Boston can get to nine to ten, it's good. You know, I mean, they didn't announce her. Um, I think that's a big mistake at this yeah. point. Yeah, it's like it, it worked for Punk. It's not the prototype. They should have been, they should have advertised Okada coming in. It couldn't have hurt. Okay, certainly would have sold more tickets in Atlanta because when, when they announced Okada for um, Philadelphia, they they had a big boost in ticket sales. Um, like if you're in these cities and you're doing seven, eight thousand, like you're like WWE, you know, and look, WWE and you know, they announce who's going to be there and they announce matches, but, and, and they don't need to because they've already got those big advances. But if you've got, you know, anything to sell tickets, I, I mean, you're, you know, I don't think AEW keeping things surprise is, is, is beneficial. I just don't, I mean, like the, the Atlanta attendance wasn't good for Atlanta to me. Um, you know, it's like what AEW is doing three thousand to me. When when you're when you're back when you're getting when you're getting seven thousand a week, you can start doing surprises until you're getting there. You know, I don't think. You know, I don't think that the surprise thing. You know, again, it worked with Punk. That doesn't, it's not, it worked, be, you know, it worked because it was a weird, unique situation. This is not that situation and, and whatever, you know, I mean, they just, they chose, but I mean, even tonight watching Collision, they pushed the hell out of big business, but they pushed the six man tag and they, they didn't really push Samoa Joe and Wardlow hard, but they did push it. They told you what that, it's going to be there. You've got a loaded show. They didn't tell you hey, there's going to be this big surprise. They didn't even <laughs> say that. Like if they said like there's going to be a surprise, it's going to shock you, and then everyone's going to whatever. They should have just said she's coming in and blah 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 blah. But they didn't even say there's going to be a surprise, and so, so it's like I don't really understand the the marketing and the promotion. The presentation is fantastic. I thought Collision Tonight was a really good show. I thought Dynamite was a great show. Um, but they're delivering is good. I think that aspects of the booking short term and long term are actually very good sometimes when people go oh the booking is not good it's like actually it's pretty damn good right now since december but the advertising and the build of shows um you know i mean it's, like i said the presentation of the product is great 
the advertising in the build of shows, um, they need to be concentrating more on that because it is that that is what sells tickets. It is not the giving you a bunch of great matches. It's hyping. It's a business, the business of hype. It's not the presentation is great to have. It's the business of hype. And you going in and there and, 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 and holding your hat to presentation. It's like presentation without hype, um, you know, is, you know, you're, you're only playing half the game, you know, you know, so. How, how much of that Ballyhoo book have you read? Most. Yeah. That book is really good. Really good. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, the, the thing about that book that was so great to me was even though it's completely, you know, wrestling is different than it was five years ago, let alone we're going back a hundred years. Cause that's what a lot of this book was 19, yes. 20, 20 years ago. However, there are things that you can read and go like, wow, so much of this is the same too. I, I was, I was reading Jack. The, the, I'm, I'm still very early in the book. So it's about how Jack Curley gets into promoting and just his description or his definition of, of what actual promotion is and, and such like that stuff is, is really fascinating to me, especially how his career as a wrestling promoter comes out of him trying to promote boxing. And the reason why wrestling was easier to promote is because you didn't need to sanction anything and the cops were constantly trying to break up these boxing fights. And so you'd have to kind of advertise them on the sly. And you couldn't really tell people where they were because then the cops would be there. But pro wrestling, people didn't really take it as sport. So you could just do it wherever and yet still make the gambling revenue off of it. Like that whole stuff is fascinating to me. But as you're talking about the advertising and the promotion, uh, every I, I'm telling everybody who has any interest whatsoever in the history to just read it because I, I, I it's 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 one of the most interesting books that I think I've read in a long time. No matter the topic, like it's like the way that the author and the I thought the right the writing is excellent too. It's such a very well researched. The, the, the guy studied really hard too. So good. Yeah, um, yeah. All right. Sorry I mean, for the insight. The, the, the other thing that I loved was the description of people, you know, like the description of the fans there basically going like like the the guys talking to their to their girlfriends and their girlfriends are going like, oh, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, it's, don't worry, it's all fake. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's like people people sitting there going like, oh, yeah, it was it was real back then. And number one, it was never real. But the other part is, is that the audience didn't. It's the same thing. If you read the old newspaper stories from the 1920s and everything like that, everything is tongue in cheek. I mean, they covered it like crazy because there was a lot of interest in it. But it was like, you know, like the whole Dan O'Mahony, if you know, look through. I mean, this guy was a major, major celebrity during his his big run, you know, like like in, in some ways bigger than anyone today in the sense that, you know, like. When he would go out on dates, it'd be covered because he was like, you know, this big star. Oh, Dan O'Mahony dated this woman from wherever or in Boston. And, you know, it's like that he was that big of a star that who he dated was news. Oh, he's getting engaged. Oh, you know, like, like but at the same time, it's like they're also explaining that Dan O'Mahony is this guy being brought in to be a superstar by the promoter because they want an Irish star in Boston and he's not, you know, he's, they found this guy and it's like, it's not real or anything. And then some guy shot on him, which ruined the whole scheme. And, you know, <laughs> well, I this, just, I different. just loved the, just the description of the style. It's like, well, there was this collar and elbow tie up style and you're just trying to put the other person on the ground. And then they realized that there was a Greco Roman, which had some grappling in it. And then people realized that they could actually make the grappling more dramatic just by listening to the crowd and they could time certain moves and time right. ways that they could get like that stuff. I'm just like, Oh my gosh, like this is, this is amazing to like even think back then at that level that they're literally just listening to the crowd in these long fall matches to, to time for the drama and the suspense and everything. Yeah. 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 It's always been like that and it always will. Um, and it will always change too, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's about what, what, you know, what the, what's the crowd buying tonight? 
I think that's one of the lost arts in, in, in that lost arts, but things that people don't understand is like, you know, they think like, Oh, this is a great match. And it's like, what is a great match on a Monday in one city can be a crap match, move for move in another city on a Tuesday. There's no style that is the right style. And there's no style. That's the wrong style. The style is what works, you know, and, and you, if you get something and it's working, then it, then you, then it's good. And if you feel it's not working, you throw it out and you learn and throw something else in. It's, you know, what works and doesn't work. And that's how you learn your style essentially is what works for you, you know, and, and what works for every person is different. Like what works for Randy Orton wouldn't work for Ricochet. It wouldn't. He'd Ricochet try to wrestle like Randy Orton. He'd never get anywhere. You know, I mean, it's like, because, you know, everyone's, everyone's different and everyone's got different, um, you know, your size makes a difference. Your aura makes a difference. You know, you just got to work to your strengths. And some people don't like people who work to their strengths when they get over, which is the weirdest thing in, in the world to me. You know, you just mentioned evolution of, of style, and I it made me think because um, not only does wrestling in the ring have to evolve, but also the way you get heat has to evolve. And, and the, the reason why I say that is because uh, Roman Reigns used a line on SmackDown, which I think even 10 years ago, no one would have even batted an eye about. He called Seth Rollins a cross dresser. Yeah, which and which, when and it when doesn't, it, it doesn't fly today. It doesn't fly today. When it came out of his mouth, I almost saw him like wish that he had pulled it right back in his mouth because he knew at that time, oh my gosh, like the, I this is not something that I, I should have said. And I found the dialogue around whether or not that was a bad line to be very interesting. And, you know, I, I'm reading, uh, as I've said on this show before, I love reading your old stuff. And I can take that old stuff, and I'm reading 1989 right now. And there's a time and place for that old stuff. But you, in even 1989, you will write something about how this would have been okay in the 70s, but this is not okay now. And And just so, like, my mentality uh, of this stuff – I'm constantly shifting to sort of present day and, and and such, but I, I, I'm, I thought the discourse around that, that word was actually really interesting because you had a lot of people who were saying, here's why you can't say that today, but you had other people going, going like, well, I wasn't offended. And I was like, of course you're not offended. Why would you be? You know, you know, I'm not offended by hardly any, the only thing that offends me and always did were, were a racist angles, you know, things like that. If someone, when I guess this is a homophobic angle, so maybe I should be, but, but um, I, I just think it's stupid in this day and age. That's all. Well, I, think I mean, you know, the WWE itself, and we'll, this is going to segue into the Mark Shapiro thing because he, the way that he presents WWE, the product is as like this thing that everybody loves kids, men, women, children, everybody. And so that I think that's why it's important because if if WWE wants to attract the largest audience possible, uh, inclusivity is is important to them, and uh, import should be important to everybody. Yeah, but and, at, the same time, at the same time, playing it safe. You know, when when WWE didn't play it safe, that's when they attracted the large audience. When WWE did offend people, is when they attracted the large audience. There's 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 things that you can do to attract a larger audience, but they're, what they're looking for is the largest sponsorship, which is a different thing. Their audience, they've got an audience that will be there because of the star power, and, and they're hot right now. But what they're looking, you know, one of the things they're looking for is sponsors and not to get sponsors mad. And that's a hard one because wrestling does have to take risks to, ex in, in, you know, and, and, and that, that line's not a risk. That line's just stupid. But there are risks that are, you know, could be things that some people might find offensive. And then you've got to balance it in. Well, if someone complains to the sponsors, how would the sponsors react? And it's like the sponsors really don't want to react, but they also may feel a duty in certain cases that they have to. I mean, I think the sponsors really, most sponsors don't really care about morals, moralistic or anything like that. But still, when it comes to wrestling, um, you know, a, a, a business that still has a hard time getting sponsorships, 
Um, you've got to sometimes, you know, you, sometimes you take risks, but sometimes you have to be careful not to offend the wrong person. And like if one sponsor drops, you know, they, they can drop like dominoes too. So it's like, you've always got to be careful. Well, yeah, there, I think there's an edge to, to things that, and, and, and you can sort of get close to that edge on certain topics, but the flip side is tonight's UFC where they blatantly uh, promote Donald Trump. Poor John Anik. I don't know what John Anik's politics are, but he had to put Donald Trump over like three different times on this show. And I just, and the place goes, and there was nobody on the entire card that got a bigger reaction than him. No, and and you know, I just thought, I thought, you know, and that's a pol- that's polarizing as hell. And but there's also a part of it where if Anik is. You know, if he if he is not a Donald Trump fan, it almost is sort of his job to pretend that, you know, this guy is worth all of the the stuff that that he is saying. And uh, that that's an that's an interesting one I, that that would be uh, well, really, really know, hard you know, for they, me. For sure. I mean, I can't say anything in the sense of UFC's business is doing really, really good and no sponsors are pulling out or anything like that um, at, at all. But. There absolutely are people who will not, you know, buy UFC pay-per-views because of Donald Trump. I don't think there's a lot of them, but they do exist. I know they exist. Um, and there are people who are absolutely hate, you know, that, you know, with, with that, that UFC, you know, does that. But, you know, obviously he loves it because, look, this is a guy, as somebody pointed out to me just tonight, who never went to UFC before. It's not like he was a guy who would be going – you know, to, to show off show. He went every now and then, right? But now, you know, he's going to go in Florida because he's going there because it is, you know. Because he's getting cheered. That's why he's, he's, getting, he's getting cheered like crazy. And it's fun for him to go out there and they freaking play entrance music for the guy. And, and it's a visual that he can use in his promotion of himself. Absolutely. To back up him saying that everybody loves him and, and X, Y, and Z. And I, I didn't want to even make this political, but I just, I just thought the – you know, you have UFC really going heavy into this thing. And it seems like WWE, especially now today, you know, they really need to watch themselves more than ever because of, you know, what. Well, they don't want to, they don't want to turn off part of their audience. Well, I mean, one of these, ever since Trump won the presidency, WWE, from, from a public standpoint on television, never mentioned him. They could go, hey, our Hall of Famer and blah, blah, blah. The guy we, he did WrestleMania. You know what I mean? When they do their WrestleMania highlights, they don't put him in. And the reason is, is because they are cognizant that there's a lot of their audience that that doesn't like him. So we're going to play it safe. You know, I mean, that's the basic gist. It's like we're not going to insult him or anything like that either, because that's going to insult some of our audience, too. So we just play it safe and we just ignore everything. You know, UFC doesn't play it safe there. But, you know, I will say this for Dana, too. It's like Dana's not playing it safe. Dana, Dana is is very much where Vince used to be in the sense that I think he feels that nothing, he, you know, he can do anything. He can do anything because he's Dana White and nobody else can promote this shit like him. And, you know, people like that often run into the iceberg too, as Vince did. I mean, he's, he slapped his wife and it was all over the internet and nothing negative happened to him. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Which only in the end, the fact that nothing happened it's the same thing with Vince when when Vince was um, in that trial and he and he didn't get convicted, which he shouldn't have been. But that's a different story. But it's kind of like at that point, it emboldens you. It's like I can do anything I want. And, um, you know, I mean, and, and, and generally you probably can up to a point and maybe hopefully for, for Dana White's sake, he will never cross that point. Um, and Vince did. Um, so. You know, but but, but I do, I do think, times. but I do, but I do think that Dana, I do think that Dana is incredibly emboldened, and and to the point, it's so interesting because the Bud Light sponsorship is almost the other side of it. You know, it's like mm-hmm. they got um, they got criticism from the other side, um, you know, the the right side, you know, which you know is Trump's side. The, they kid, the kid rock stuff you're talking about. Yeah, right, right. But they got criticized from the other side, um, you know, from their, their from their side, so to speak, for the Bud Light thing, because the Bud Light boycott and, and Dana told them, you know, to go to hell on the boycott and they're going to be our sponsor, yeah. you know. Um, 
because that's what Dana will do. He's just, you know, it's not, it's not like with Dana, it's not so much right and left. It's kind of like just who was my friend this week. Right. And they can be right and they can be left. Like he'll, he'll, Dana, Dana will, you know, I mean, if there's a Democrat running for, it won't be president because he's going to, he's already got his favorite there, but running for the Senate in Nevada that kisses up to Dana, Dana will do the same. He'll bring them out there. We may not give them entrance music, but he'll bring them out there. And, 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 you know, if you're my friend, I think Dana's loyalty is to his friend as opposed to political parties, I think. But the fact is his friend is this guy. And so everybody kind of views it as, and, you know, and you have the right to do that. You know, I mean, I don't, at people who are mad about it, I mean, I go like, look, I, you got every right to be mad about it. You got every right in the world to be mad about it. And if, if I was running UFC, I would not do it, but Dana's going to do it. He's going to do, you know, if you're his friend, he'll do it for you. All right. A couple more topics here. And we also have uh, a uh, super chat to get to. Um, Mark Shapiro did an interview, talked a lot about TKO, talked a lot about WWE. He specifically said in Q4, they are not going to have a rights fee for Raw. He did not say we have a plan B for that. He just li- he just said, oh, you know, we don't have a, a rights fee for, for, for Q4. Well, they have nothing. They have nothing lined up, which is interesting because you'd think that when they made that move, they would have something lined up and they got nothing lined up. Um, but, yeah, they're going with the assumption. Um, and that's the reason why WWE is not going to grow this year. Um you know, even with all the cuts that they've made and the, the changing jobs and duplication of jobs between UFC, WWE is not going to grow this year because that seventy-five million or so, seventy million, um, whatever you know that you would get in quarter four for raw rights fees, you're not getting it because they don't have anything lined up. And who's going to want to pay? I mean, like, who's going to want to pay any kind of money for raw that you're only getting for three months? No one, you know, you want to pay 70 million and you got it for three months. It's a waste. You're losing it right away anyway. So it's like they may, you know, they may find a way to put it on TV for free or put it on, maybe they'll put it on YouTube or who knows what, but it's like, who wants to pay a ton of money for something you're about to lose, you know, in three months, it's not worth it. Could they go live on Peacock? Yeah, but you know, is that, is that what um, they would want? Well, uh, I, I mean, I don't know what the money would be, but for Peacock, they would probably get. So they'll get, subs. What, they'll get subs for three months. I, it's, but how much is it worth? Like, is it worth 10 million? Yeah, probably. You know, is it, is it worth. Well, what would they, I mean, it's not worth what the, uh, the NFL playoff game was worth. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, it's, it's, it's worth something to them, you know, but again, but you want, like, if you're Peacock is trying to build. So is, is, if you're looking at something short term, you know, it's like, is it, is it worth deficit spending for something you're not going to keep? I don't think so. But if you can get it for free, of course. Yeah. Of course. What, what if they did a deal where they extended the, uh, the, uh, the pay-per-view deal out a little bit? Or something, or or they they did something. There's always ways to do it. You know, there's always ways to you can you can do it. I'm just it, trying to think of how why it would make sense for WWE to to do well, that, or for, mean, or for NBC to do that. Yeah, well, I mean WWE is just it's just a you know they're getting you know you know the future is Netflix for them. So I mean, as far as this, in the three months is a three month blip, and I think they're just looking for a way to keep this the ball rolling and put it on because they've never gone dark. They're not going to go dark. The thing is, is look look. So they're going to lose a little bit of money by, by um, you know, spending all that money every week and not getting a rights fee or getting a minimal rights fee. But guess what? It's just they they got plenty of cash on hand and long term, it's not, you know, they're going to make up for it. So it's like it's nothing to cry over. But yeah, yeah, they're going to have um, they're going to have, a, you know, something in the in the fourth quarter, whatever it is. You, know? you, you also mentioned that he believes that the. PLEs are underpriced. He made sure to say that they did not sign a bad deal. He said they signed a great deal. And because both parties uh, exceeded, you know, what what they were doing, it's now worth a lot more. Uh, He mentioned Royal Rumble specifically. Uh, He didn't, he didn't actually mention WrestleMania, but he mentioned like the non WrestleMania shows being like just doing much more than, than they, you know, they thought or, or something like that. 
And then he also said the the Netflix deal initially started as a conversation about NXT. Yep. That is fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, and, it, and, and obviously the conversation about NXT was not for a lot of money. Netflix is I, I'm not, you know, I think a lot of people believe that net the Netflix has some really smart people working, but you know, I have a feeling at the, I don't know at what part of, of the deal, but I have a feeling Mark Shapiro is going to be on a show in five years going like, man, Netflix got a really, really good deal for us yes. because I just think that that price, uh, they, got, they, got a, they got a really good Netflix made a real good deal for the, the from a price standpoint for that franchise. Um, they got a lot for, I mean, it's a good amount of money, but if WWE would have kept all these international deals separate, I mean, and one of the things that, that people, and again, and again, a lot of this, okay, from, from a United States standpoint, this is fine. And United States is their market, and most of their revenue comes from the United States. But from an international standpoint, um, they're giving up a lot of exposure in a lot of places by going on Netflix. But in doing so, the idea is, is that Netflix will grow in these places and it will end up being bigger than television in these markets where it's not. And then that very well may happen. Um, but I know people who have looked at it from outside of the U S standpoint going like, you know, they're number one, you know, they're going to, you know, like in the UK, let's just say, or in wherever, you know, it's like, you're not even going to get your TV rights fee, which was, you know, if, if it escalated every year it would be way higher than the percentage that's coming from the net, from the Netflix deal. And even in the U S you could say the same thing because um, you're locked in for 10 years if Netflix wants you for the 10 years and um, and maybe longer um, if Netflix wants you, you know, the, the way, the way the thing's set up. Um, so, you know, it's like, but for right now they're, they're, you know, they're giving Netflix has got it. They gave, they made a very good deal for what they perceived to be fantastic long-term exposure, but in doing so sacrificed perhaps, significant revenue to do so. Um, so we'll see. I don't know how much data Netflix shares with their partners, but if you're WWE and you know where the growth is worldwide and you can target those places to run shows and get those site fees because you know that the, the act, the, uh, you know, the, the, that the popularity is there that that's almost worth more than yeah. what what they could pay you on some on yeah but, like but 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 you know in these markets what you're getting on television you know probably better than i mean like yeah wwe will know what they're doing on netflix they'll know they'll they'll have that information but the fact is they had that information from television already in most of these places but the information might be more detailed it might be yeah because i mean that that's that's what makes these tech companies so good is they're just serving up shows that they're kind of sure that you're going to like. And if not, they're going to be pretty close on your tastes and stuff like it's that whole thing is, uh, is fascinating. Okay. A couple more things. Uh, and you know what, we're going to run out of time talking about stuff. So I'll just let Brian know what we did not get to, but I wanted to get to this super chat here from trust the process if Punk never got hurt and Rock still wanted to wrestle, do you think we'd get the tag match? And would Punk have taken the Seth spot? Um, there's so many variables. Um, the fact is, is that if um, Punk never gets hurt, none of this happens um, because they would have done. They were already injured Cody. And they wouldn't have been able to bring him back. And maybe whether the people would have accepted it or not is a different, a different situation. I don't but know. If, if, if punk if punk doesn't get hurt um you know i mean cody's going to get this giant injury rock's going to stand in for him and then cody's going to come back bigger than ever i mean that was the idea that's why he won the rumble was to make it you know like bigger than ever so um yeah punk doesn't get injured none of this happens you know because the whole reason they did it the way they did was well we can't injure him because now we got somebody. We need somebody to face Seth. And as it turns out, the guy's facing Seth is Drew, not Cody. So there you go. They could have done. They could have done what they did anyway. 
or what they planned in the first place. But that, you know, that's how it all went down. All right. From Curtis, uh, he, he is, he believes that Tony Khan is a giant fan of Paul Heyman's ECW and that yes, ECW yes. is a giant influence on the AEW product. Absolutely. That's why we get those those table stuff constantly. Absolutely, 100%. And even the surprise, Paul Heyman was the guy. Somebody, who was it that wrote me? And I may have written it 30 years ago anyway, but or 20 years ago, but um, said that like one of the worst things that Paul brought was the expectation of the surprise because, because um, you know, now you have this thing of people looking for this, this pop rather than revenue. You know what I mean? And it's fine, you know, it's fine for certain people and everything like that. And Paul would get these giant pops. They never made him any money, but they were giant pops. And everybody, you know, grew up, you know, went with this idea, like, this is so cool. You know, the pop became, it used to be about money and then it became about the pop. And it's just a different, and now, you know, with, with WWE, my, you know, might as well be about the pop because the fact is you got all the money in the world and you don't need to be scrambling for money. And if Tony doesn't need to scramble for money, you know, I don't know. You know, again, I, I, you know, there's nobody who knows except for Tony and maybe, maybe Shad, the real mentality, you know, you're people, Oh, he doesn't care about losing money. And yeah, I know he does. Um, I know, I know enough to know, but like what, at what point, you know, are these things important? You know, I have a feel for it, but I don't know a hundred percent. And most people don't know anything because they're not even going to have a feel for it. Cause at least I'm in contact with them all the time. You know? Well, I, I mean, I think if he was worried about that, the first well, thing he would do is cut the roster down. And exactly. He, so that, I mean, that's, the, that's, that's the whole point. Whenever I hear people talk about the losses and it's like, if the losses become something important, we will know because there's there's a million. Number one, he could cut down the roster. Number two, he could do things in a, in different manners that are cost savings that he's not doing. And when he starts doing that, and and number three is we wouldn't get Mercedes Monet, yeah, and we wouldn't get Okada. We might get Osprey because Osprey, you know what I mean. But the point is, like, he might bring one of them in. But it's like when 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 the top free agents are out there and he is not bidding for them, then we will know that, okay, he's going to, he's not going to be spending millions of dollars on one piece of talent right now because maybe the finances, but we very obviously this last two months have told us that money concerns are not that big of a deal to him because he's looking at if what he is saying is reality, and I, it probably is, is that he expects that this year is a build to get a big TV deal, which will make them very profitable. So some losses this year on buying all these guys and improving the product in by, by having this great talent will pay off next year. And they're not, you know, they're not in danger of going out of business unless they can't get a TV deal. And then and they're probably not in danger of going out of business even then, but um, Man, they just did a new set and graphics and, and, and they didn't have to do any of that. That's, that's expenses that you don't need to do, but you're doing it because they're building, they're doing everything they're doing this year is to build for this TV deal. Now, granted, you got to get your ratings up or keep the same. I mean, but again, like when I say ratings up, it's like ratings are like a, a you know, you know, ratings are based on time and place. Their ratings, um, you know, I mean the the last, this Saturday rating they were number two in their time slot. It didn't to an zero point one three. Sounds like five years ago. You go like they're gonna have the show. It's gonna do an zero point one three on a Saturday night. I'm gonna go. Oh my god, what a disaster! They were second in their time slot. That a disaster. You know the zero point two nine. They barely got beat by the NBA. They beat. They beat networks. They used to never beat networks. They're actually doing, you know, Friday's not doing so great, but, you know, that's a throwaway show in a lot of ways to me anyway. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, there's there's that. But, you know, I mean, we're going to know based on, you know, the, the TV deal and how many suitors, if they wait for suitors, because right now 
If he makes a deal now, it's going to be with WBD. WBD still got an exclusivity for, for a little while. He can't even open it up to other people. And, you know, again, um, what that means, how much, you know, he seems pretty confident of a, of a, of a big increase. And if he gets a big increase, they're home free and all these, you know, losses. I mean, it doesn't take a big increase to wipe away all these losses. You know, it, it really isn't that big. I mean, it's, it's, it's whatever it is. You know, again, I don't know how much money they lost last year. Um, but, if you know, um, and I don't know this year, like, I haven't even asked, you know, if there's any as well. I mean, I did ask, I should I take that back. I did ask about this year. And I mean, no, he does, you know, I mean, he all, he did not say this, but he indicated because I basically asked, are they going to be profitable this year? And it's just basically we're going to be profitable when we get the new TV deal and we're going to get a big increase and all this stuff. So that tells me there he's not, he's not even looking at being profitable in 2024. So people are going like, are they making a profit in 2024? It's like, he ain't even looking at that, but that's not the idea of, it's a vanity project, never looking for a profit. You know, it's like, I've been telling, you know, people like about, look, the people at NBC that are running Peacock and Peacock lost 3 billion last year and Peacock's going to lose over 2 billion this year. It's not like they're sitting there going like, Oh, I'm a mark for having all of these <laughs> shows and spending all this money on WWE pay-per-views while we're losing millions and billions of dollars. We're losing $10 million a day or whatever that number is when you, Divide 30, uh, 3 billion by 365 days, you know, you're losing whatever it is every single day. Um, you know, it's like, no, they expect it to turn around. And like, no, this is not a vanity project. He expects it to turn around next year with a big TV rights deal. And it's not inconceivable that he gets it. You know, if you look at what, you know, again, he ain't going to get what the NHL got even though his ratings kill the NHL, the NHL's doing 0.07, 0.08 on Wednesday night. They're doing triple quadruple quadruple. Sh- Sh- Shapiro also said that he believes the UFC has replaced the NHL as, as the number fourth sport. He did say that. And he's also, I will just say one thing because I remember talking to Scott Coker, not all that long ago. We were, we were, uh, I think we were at lunch and we were talking about the sharks and he just goes, you realize that they draw 18,000 people 41 times a year. And it's like, and these people try to think that MMA is bigger than hockey. (laughs) 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 And it's like, and, and it's not just in San Jose, they do it in like 30 cities. Right. I don't know if they're doing that in San Jose this year. The sharks are pretty bad. Yeah. But still, you know, it's no, I mean, as a TV sport, but they're also running one show a week and there's yeah. multiple, multiple hockey games a week, but no, they're not bigger than hockey. They're, you know, I mean, he can say that, but they're not, um, you know, I mean, um, yeah. I mean, look, as a TV sport, are they bigger? Yes. As a TV sport, as a, you know, spectator sport. No, not even <laughs> close. By the way, that video game, I know Tony had mentioned before that he had invested in the video game, which is why, uh, you know, that I, that's one of the reasons he gave as to why they wouldn't be profitable because in he 20, invested. In- well, he actually said in 2022 that if there was not a video game, they'd have made a profit in 2022 and they were going to make a profit in 2023. By all accounts, I don't think they made a profit in 2023. We we haven't heard a lot about how successful that video game is. I don't imagine it was very successful because I don't hear anything no, about because it. Because if it was, we've heard. Yeah. No. yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I go with the same thing. Do I have any facts to back that up? No. I mean, I, it's just the assumption that, you know, if it was super successful. We'd, we'd hear about the success. Yeah, no, I and and it would also help in their profitability, I would assume as well. Well, it would, it would, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so the question from Curtis was actually, if if you know what Paul Heyman thinks about AEW, he made a comment prior, uh, a, a just a generic statement about they're viable or something like that, and then he also said, could you ever see Tony making a play for Heyman when his WWE contract is up? You never say never. And I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, and Tony was a fan of ACW. I do know that when it started, um, you know, 
the name came up and I don't think that there was interest in bringing him in. Um, I don't know that he ever asked. I never heard that he asked. I just heard that it was kind of like, um, it was just like he has his style, but we got our style and we're the people who are in charge. were going to be the people who, like, like for Paul to come in and be in charge. They wanted to, you know, the people who were in charge were going to be the people in charge, not Paul Heyman. So, I mean, but again, five years from now, if he's available and, and, and would he bring him in? I think so. I think so. Look, he brought in Jen Pepperman, which I'm sure came a lot, you know, but there's, he's, he's brought in people. Um, and Paul's a fantastic TV character. So, um, I mean, is he going to bring him in to book? I, don't know. I mean, I shouldn't, you know, I would say no, but, you know, you never know. You never know. I don't expect it to ever happen. I don't, I actually expect Paul Heyman to be with WWE for life. That's my expectation, especially now. Um, yeah, it but, does seem like his relationship with them is better than ever. Yeah, yeah, with Paul Levesque and, you know, Roman Reigns and... and uh, He's the lead induction to their Hall of Fame ceremony. Yeah, the first Triple H, he's the first Paul Levesque Hall of Famer. So that that is something. They announced Windham and Rotunda, which, whatever, you know. <laughs> the only thing I remember about Windham and Rotunda is them burying Barry Windham because he left. That's, that's, Barry, Barry, Barry that's Barry really what to, I remember. Barry left to go back, yeah. Um, and had great success after, he, you know, with, with, you know, better success in WCW than there. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's, it's again, it's, it's I mean, I'm surprised they haven't announced Bray Wyatt. That's Maybe. what I was wondering if the Wyndham and Rotunda thing was going to lead to. Yeah, yeah, man, could. I mean, that's his name and that's his family. You know, it's Barry's his uncle and Mike's his dad. Um, so maybe that's part. Maybe that's part of the synergy. I think it would be, it would be awesome if they did do that this year. They should. Absolutely, they should. Yeah, well, that was the first guy I thought of when they were going to do this year. Uh, okay, uh, I think we are we are done here. So uh, long show, but uh, I think lots of good stuff in there. So I guess you and I will be back next Friday, maybe with a guest. We'll see. Yeah. But uh, otherwise, everybody have a great weekend. You and Brian will be back after Raw on Monday night. Yes. So for Dave, I'm Garrett. To everybody, thanks for watching and 